racism is your prejudice plus power. You have the power to enact on it and to change someone's circumstances or life or impact it in a negative way. American people have not dealt with it on a realistic, pragmatic level. It's very surface. It is prevalent and different and experienced differently and reflected differently in those African-Americans who were raised in the South and stay in the South than it is for those African-Americans who are from the North. The history of Black people in this country What did they go through? What was it? What was it like? They haven't seen their land in weeks. Two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. No one can say for sure, but I bet even on their way, they lost count. They knew hugging their grandmothers again, or sharing a laugh with family during nuptials, or singing lullabies to their babies that were once sung to them would not happen again. Everything they knew, everything they had, vanished. Some couldn't bear this occurrence. The Atlantic Ocean has swallowed them whole. This massive body of water seemed like an eternal doomsday in the smothering body of a ship called the White Lion. They didn't know where they were bound to. Those who couldn't bear this refused to eat, even heaved themselves over the ship's walls. But those who understood the new reality, they knew that everyone on that ship were no longer strangers. So my paternal great-grandmother, and my maternal great-grandmother were both enslaved. Um, so I can trace back, I have uh, the history from South Carolina, my family's from South Carolina. My parents grew up during the time of Jim Crow in South Carolina with segregation, uh, not being able to go to the schools, same schools as white students. Uh, at that time, not being bused because they walked and the white kids bused. But um, I have the history of my family telling me my father grew up in St. Matthew, South Carolina. So he grew up seeing the Ku Klux Klan marching through his town, uh, having segregation. My mother grew up on a farm, so it was a little less intensive. They didn't see it as much because they were self-sufficient on a farm. They only needed to go into town, you know, to, to uh, make wheat into flour, into wheat, and all those, you know, make wheat into flour. Um, but my, my great, great grandfather, so my father's grandfather was a colonel, white man, he was Irish, he's a colonel in the Confederacy. And so he actually mm -hmm. fought in the Civil War. Um, and my my grand great grandfather, he was a sharecropper originally in South Carolina, and then he ended up acquiring, buying, purchasing 130 acres of land, and had for his him and his my grandmother had 14 great grandmother had 14 children, and we still have that land. 1619. That's the year. The year people arrived to an unfamiliar land. That's the year that the privateer ship, the White Lion, sailed into the dock of what was then known as Point Comfort in what is now Hampton, Virginia. This is where 20 to 30 enslaved Africans were traded as something of value to get supplies in return. This final destination was a place where black equaled slave. At a tie is this sense of both uh, anger or even rage uh, and, and sadness. How do I feel? Um, and that competition of both anger and sadness is the sometimes uh, blatant denial of a history and, and 
some of that, the anger and the sadness is rooted in not just the lies, but it's like what, you know, just the plethora of knowledge and information that is, is kept from us. Um, us meaning everybody, but um, us in particular as Black people who are descendants of enslavement, that we in our education are just, you know, very, in many cases, very clearly robbed of an authentic um, history or truth. Uh, but there's also this like, There's this knowing and there's this intuitive something that many scholars have emphasized, and you, including um, Dr. Joy and her work, uh, and, and for centuries. But I feel like now I'm becoming more in tune with um, the, you know, ancestral connection and the reality of like our DNA and some of the 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 reality and history of trauma and that is that that can be ignited in in, in so many different ways and the discovering of that is is super uh, um, um, scary and painful but also um, a significant part of um, of a, he a healing journey. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, or PTSS, is a term and idea coined by Dr. Joy DeGroo. This awareness takes us back to the beginnings of enslavement through the clinically induced and socially learned vertical stress-related issues to help us understand the true effects of enslavement. PTSS is the condition existing because of one, multi-generational oppression from centuries of slavery involving Africans and their descendants, also referred to as chattel slavery, the buying and selling of slaves. Two, the idea that Africans African Americans were inherently and genetically inferior to whites, and three, institutionalized racism. This is multi-generational trauma linked with continual oppression and the absence of opportunity to heal. The most scary in your face kind of situation was when I went to the London program. So I, I was in 200 students that got accepted to study abroad at Ithaca College in the London Center program. I was the one black person of color <laughs> who went. So that's an experience in itself. Um, just getting into, just, just going, in the 80s, we grew up understanding, and I, I'm not saying this like they don't have this now generation, but we understood, we got to the point of waiting for the racism. So it's kind of like, okay, it's going to happen. We just need to wait. See how, you know. Um, so walking home one day, um, and I was in the tube, and I saw these two people, images. And when you're walking through an underpath, you know, there's no way. There's only two ways, one way in and one way out. You know, you either walk, keep going or you turn around and walk back. But once you're in the middle, you're there. And as I kept walking and these other two images are walking towards me, I saw it was two white men. One of them had blackface on. And so if you know what blackface is, it was the covering of, you know, all black makeup um, and the white face. So it's a caricature of black people negative during um, the, you know, the, the Sambo and all that whole image. Um, back during Jim Crow and beyond that. So naturally, there's two things that most Black people grow up understanding and being fearful of, and that's the Confederate flag and Blackface. And I had never seen that. I've never seen it in person in America, you know, at all growing up. So there was a, this to me was like visceral. This was like, you're going to walk, and I don't know, you could have a, a a clan, you know, um, uh, cross getting ready to burn us. And, uh, and I'm in there and it's just me and there's no one else. And you're, like I said, you're in the middle of the uh, underpath. So as I'm getting closer, I really see these two white men and I'm a young 20 year old, 21 year old black girl, young lady. 
and I'm thinking, this is not good. And they're telling me before I get to you what, you know, all the things you can think of that that means, you know, this is not a good situation. And all I can think of was, do I keep walking? Because if I turn and I run, then that to me suggests that I'm fearful and that puts a whole nother spin on it and they're going to come chase me and, 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 and I'm too far away from the opening to get back there and I'm too far away from the ending. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel for real. So I don't know how long it's going to be to get past them, but so what do I do? And I put my Bronx face on um, and I said, I'm just going to keep walking. The first time that I, that actually the first time that anyone ever called me, you know, a, a nigger to my face was, um, was in sixth grade um, on the bus. And I remember in it, and like looking at the kid and I didn't quite hear what he said. Um, interestingly enough, and everybody was like kind of getting into it and getting excited about it and getting riled up, but I didn't hear what he said. And interestingly enough, like this kid um, is a kid with a disability. This kid is a kid who is deaf. and and in and, and I didn't hear what he was saying. So I leaned in. This is like several rows. I'll never forget it. But trying to like get because he was clearly he was he was he was he was talking to me. And in what he was saying was like it was almost like he had just 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 I, I, I don't know. I have all types of interpretations of it. But what he said to me, he's looking down and he was like, oh. He said, oh, you're a nigger. I had sat with him a couple times and there was like this, this history textbook and um, there were other older students who were, who were learning about slavery. And so I think that generated certain conversations on the bus because I remember overhearing some pieces. But anyway, there was this interaction and he's like down a few rolls and he's like shouts to me. He's like, oh, he's like, oh, you're a nigger. And it was just like, I don't know, it's interesting to hear people talk about, you know, either being called the word so many times that they don't remember the first time, or then some folks who like remember that first time. And see, here I am already in a space where I'm not safe. I'm always thinking about the effects of historical, um, historical trauma and how that plays out but also you know the term of, of post-traumatic uh, slave syndrome in a lot of ways because of coming out of bondage from the physical from physical bondage but the term bondage meaning um enslaving of the mind you know the classical conditioning of slavery and then how that trans poses itself into mental limitations that people deal with, African-Americans deal with self-image, um, and then compounded by institutionalized racism and all of those things that come from, you know, high incarceration rates, um, not being able to understand the community that you're in. That whole, oh my goodness, that whole slave, um, mentality and that whole slavery uh intention of you know um kind of the massa and the slave so it's it's you know the institutionalized part is is relevant relative relevant you see it but sometimes it's not when it's not talked about it's hard to understand it and i think that's the counseling piece we don't we don't necessarily we're try, trying to survive something doesn't mean you have the opportunity, usually doesn't mean that you don't have the opportunity to think about it, stop, assess it, heal, <laughs> and then be able to change some things and move on. And I, with PTSS, I think the underlying premise is, clinically speaking, we've not had the opportunity to reflect and then holistically you know, the individual, um, reflect and then understand or appreciate the dynamics of what has occurred 
and how it can have a impact on us, you know, and on the individual. It's hard to do that individually. And how do we know that? Because we see the high rises of, of stress and induced illnesses from diabetes to heart attacks to uh, what do you call it? Um, strokes. Um, so it's something internally you have to deal with, but then it's something that systematically you have to deal with. And that's a big, and first you have to acknowledge it. Because it literally, when you do this work, when you are in this particular conversation, when you are a, a, a black person whose history is rooted in enslavement and you are discussed, because see, like I said in the beginning, there's so much that is kept from us. When you are in the space of uncovering, learning, discovering, and beginning to unlearn, it's... <laughs> it's an intense process. It's a, it's in again. It's ongoing. But for 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 some of you, for many of you, for some of us, um, it's it's later in life, and and it is this level of not just like shocked and amazed, but sometimes diving so deeply into the truth of the roots and nature of our pain and 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 history there is this intense experience of a relief i think we will continue to suffer from our traumatic realities and traumatic even responses to additional and continuous trauma when we aren't given or provided with space and nurturing um, opportunities to learn, to dig deep, um, to feel, to unpack, to cry, to scream, to breathe, to get creative establishing a relationship with with discomfort because ain't nothing about this history comfortable as somebody getting quite quite a bit older i think about history and where is the evidence of our lives where is it stored is it stored anywhere and it's important to store that because we have to learn is it? from ourselves. <laughs> Does I, I it matter that, that I or you spend a life here on this planet and there's no evidence that we were here? Uh, it's a hard question. I'm Donna Eschenbrenner. I'm the archivist here at the History Center in Tompkins County. Several years ago, one of our former directors described the History Center as Tompkins County's attic. I like that analogy. It really hones in on the fundamentals of what we do here at the History Center. Think about what a family preserves in their family attic. You know, a great grandmother's wedding dress, a grandfather's pocket watch, family letters, photographs, scrapbooks, the kinds of things that tell the story of the family. Well, what we do here at the History Center is analogous to that. It's the same thing only on a community-wide level. We preserve the material culture of all of Tompkins County's families, all of Tompkins County's history. As archivist, I manage the archives and the research library and all the collections. We came into this space with a very large collection. We love this building. This is still a relatively new building for us. Um, we've only been here for about eight months. It's beautiful, it's historic, the location is fabulous, and we love it, but it's not big. And the only way we were able to make this smaller space work was by investing very heavily in what are called movable shelves. If we set up regular shelving, like library shelving or archi archival shelving, we could not have managed in this space. But what enabled us to do it is these. These actually will move. And what it enabled us to do is fit the very large collection of materials that we have.
scrapbooks, photographs, maps, newspapers, manuscript collections, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of linear feet of paper materials that document the history of the county. I think one of the Treeman family who was editor of the Ithaca Journal. Right. And there's a whole piece of, have you run across this? No. My wife's family uh, would vacation up in northern New Hampshire. Her parents actually moved there. And the local weekly there, which is still in business, would report things like people visiting the local McDonald's for lunch. Uh, nothing like that happened here. It was local news, but actually covered by reporters. Just starting in the early 1970s, there began to be a couple of local weeklies, one of which was called the Grapevine, and another of which was called the Good Times Gazette. Um, and that paper combined with uh, a paper called the New Times from Syracuse, to become the Ithaca Times, which is still in business to this day. The grapevine, I'm afraid, is long gone, but I wrote for it. And they would cover entertainment mostly, uh, music acts and other things coming to town, and write about that, write about local restaurants. I reviewed restaurants. I began to review, to some extent, the wine industry because I had a relative working in that. My first job in Ithaca was actually pruning grapevines in February, which is a tough piece of work. But that became news as well. And going way back, uh, there was all kinds of local coverage back around the turn of the 20th century, I think. And before that, newspapers were really different. If you look back on some of the historical copies that we have here at the History Center, you'll see that news coverage was really different in the 1800s. We have newspapers dating back to about 1817. That's more than 200 years old. That's a, around the time of the founding of Tompkins County. So these are things that are very important to research of all kinds. A local newspaper from 1817 can tell you so much about the life of a community at that time. Journalism throughout the United States, probably throughout the world, is in a state of flux. Local newspapers are dying. Um, news sources are becoming more and more diverse. And what... What I'm seeing here as an archivist, um, more and more people are relying on newspapers, paper papers, the real old fashioned news from the past to research local history. Unfortunately, the kind of paper that's been used in newsprint for many, many years is not resilient at all and it breaks down. It deteriorates, it's very acidic. We're seeing other venues of information and story sharing emerge primarily through social media. You know, saving newspaper articles and preserving obituaries and death notices, things that have long been staples of how you collect and preserve a community history and share stories. Well, what about people who worked in local stuff in 1980 or 1990? What is the record of them? I did a radio show and a lot of that was recorded as MP3s on CDs. Most of those, who's gonna play them? <laughs> you know, we, we, we went through uh, VHS tape, pretty much all gone, if the tape itself can survive. Uh, there were multi-track audio tapes of famous rock groups that are totally unplayable or can be played once by baking them in an oven at a low temperature, and then you get one chance to play them and copy them to something else, and then it's gone. But there are archives of these local weeklies that you can look up. And um, the evidence for what people were doing turn up both in the stories and in letters to the editor, which people would write in commenting on the stories, and that's where you find the evidence. Otherwise, we don't have much. Right. Then again, we don't have much from George Washington, except he wrote a lot of letters and people don't do that anymore. They write emails or Twitters or something like that. And are those archived anywhere? I think one of the, the biggest challenges for us in the next five, 10 years is the move towards digitization. We're seeing pressures from granting organizations and from community members that there is the expectation that uh, the materials in our archives, the stuff that we take into our collections should be accessible online because that is often now where people's first point of engagement with. And so I think that is something that 
mirrors trends in the journalism field. More and more people are expecting news stories to be accessible online through their phones um, instead of arriving in their mailbox in the form of a newspaper in the morning for breakfast. I think we have a lot to learn from each other and working together about, okay, when stories, narratives, um, important events happen in the community uh, and journalists and news organizations are putting that content online. Is there a way to stream that collection so that it can be archived and digitized in a way that is valuable for us as a history museum and then also for future generations coming in to use our archives for research work? When I started working here, I started here as a volunteer working for the gentleman who was archivist at the time. And the first time he handed me a collection of documentary materials to process, I was kind of awestricken. You know, he was handing it was a collection of um, uh, business records from a, a local store, and he showed me a receipt from 1878. And I thought, okay, somebody 120, 30 years ago was holding this, documenting this purchase. You know of you know, several barrels of, you know, wheat. Those people are gone, but I have their information here and I can pass it on. And that resonated with me. That really resonated with me. One of the things that we try to do here as educators, we're not just preservationists, but we're also here to encourage access and use of all these materials. One of the things that I try to do as much as possible is teach people, students especially, it's how to get into that imaginative exercise of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, what was life like? That knowledge is not just some esoteric, you know, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, unimportant thing. It's, it's critically important. Knowing where we've been, knowing what we've had, knowing what our community was like informs what we have now. And it helps inform us to see where we're going to be going in the future. Arts and culture in local history specifically is the connective tissue that binds this all together. Um, and when you don't have that, it, there is a detrimental impact on the communities. It is one of the, the key indicators for sort of community health and wellness. Only by dint of luck is any of this stuff preserved. You know, you, you can't tell. But I have hopes that some will survive. There's so much. התקרבתי עם הילדה על הכתפיים אל החיילים, והנאצי, הפולסקי דויטשה הארור, וניסיתי להסביר להם שאני הולך עם אחותי החולה שנפצעה ולא מסוגלת ללכת, ואני צריך להביא אותה לאיזה מקום על מנת שיטפלו בה. ביקשתי ממהם שישחררו אותי מהעבודה. הפולסקי דויטשה, הנאצי, הארור, העמלק, התת אנושי, התנפל עליי וצרח. תכף היא תקבל טיפול. So my dad was my role model. I knew that uh, my father is a Holocaust survivor. He never talked about the Holocaust until I was pretty old. Looking back, it was hard for him to express happy emotions. He was just focused on bringing food to the family. He always used to tell us, you have to finish the food in the plate. There are some other people that they don't have the luxury that you have. They don't have food on the table. And later on, I understood it was one of the things that, you know, he was operating out of being starving for such long periods of time during the Holocaust. Uh, my relationship with him was very special. We had a special bond. I am the um, first and one of the only grandchildren to join the army, which brought us a lot closer. He will always hold a special place in my heart. My stepdad and my mom got married when I was uh, around eight years old and 
I grew really close with Avram and we formed an instant bond. He had very high motivation. And the motivation was to show the Germans that he's here now and he's created a great family. And by every day being healthy and having a family, he's winning over the Germans. He, he lived to be 94 years old. And um, he kept saying all the time, it's one of the signs, one of the wins over the Nazis. You know, it's like to show the Nazis that he managed to survive and he managed to have a family and we will be here forever. But he really, really understood that it's important for, for Jewish people to tell their stories, just like the Agadah in, in Seder Pesach. It says in the Agadah, Bechol dor vador amdu alenu lechalotenu. Meaning, in every generation, someone tried to extinguish the Jewish people. And we should always tell it, all this experiencing to our kids, to make sure that they tell it to their kids. That was part of his mission. And the name of the book was Avari Chai Betochi, meaning my past live within me without the punctuation. In Hebrew, you can call it Avari, my past, or you can pronounce it Ivri. Ivri, it's the ancient word for Jewish person. It is a very unique name that it's Ivri and Avari. His father, my grandfather, his name was Eliezer, and, uh, and his mom, her name was Chaya Bela. And he had an older brother, Zalman, that actually escaped to Ukraine and uh, parts that today it's like part of uh, Russia. And, and since then, my father never saw him. And then he had a little sister, her name was Hannah. Hannah stayed with her mom to take care of uh, her mom and later on he understood that uh, both of them were taken to the death camp. His father, my grandfather, uh, actually died from starvation in the ghetto because he insisted to eat only kosher food. He used to work in the ghetto and ghetto lodge and uh, one day the German came and were looking for all the young people that were capable of working to take them but I know that he decided to escape and then he came back to the ghetto later on to go back to his family. At some point they did come and find him and took him to the labor camp and he was uh, over there. It was uh, not too far from a uh, uh, lodge. This cycle happened a few times, but two times the Germans did find him and took him to a uh, labor camp. תפס את הילדה מגבי, ובפראות, לפני שהבנתי מה קרה, עם רצח בעיניים, 
מעוקמות מתאוות הרצח והסדיזם, זרק אותה בכל כוחו, כמו חבילה, הרחק ממני, מעל ערימת אדמה שנשארה כנראה מבור שחוסה קודם. שמעתי בכי איום של הילדה. היא נפלה על הערימה והתגלגלה למטה. כנראה הראש שלה נתקל במשהו קשה בנפילה. three years old or four years old, um, just crying and running and terrified, uh, in shock. So uh, he wanted to help her. And for weeks, he took care of her. He found food for her and he found shelter for them until the incident that uh, the Germans uh, murdered her. And he asked her, what's her name? She didn't respond. So my father gave her sort of a nickname because uh, he missed his sister and he called her little Hanale. And then they got stopped by Nazis and uh, the baby was crying, Hanna was crying, and he tried to protect her and to shield her, but the soldiers took the baby from his arms and bashed her against a rock so she would stop crying. The Nazis took away the little girl from him and basically just, you know, hit her really hard, took the girl and just threw her on, on, on a rock, uh, on a big rock next to him and pretty much killed her. And that's one of the stories that I remember that my father was telling me that really, really traumatized him. <laughs> דם זורם מראשה הקטן והיא התגלגלה למטה. היה נראה לי שהיא מסתכלת אליי בעיניים, בעיניים מאשימות. העיניים האלה, כמו אומרות לי, אני סמכתי עליך, שאתה אחי הגדול, תגן עליי, ואתה לא באת להציל אותי מהאכזרים האלה. מאז, העיניים הגדולות האלה והעצובות האלה רודפות אותי כל השנים. pretty graphic and it's really intense but um, like he made it through it and he did whatever he had to do and you have to remember that, that you it's your life at the end of the day too and no matter about the people around you which is also a very heavy factor but you just have to keep on going and uh, do what it takes to survive and that's what he truly did he decided to to join young Jewish people group that uh, they were helping other Jewish uh, towards the end of the war to go to Israel. There were uh, some uh, big ships that were taking Jews to Israel, but it was very difficult to get to those ships. You had to cross a couple borders. So he was working for a long time. Uh, a couple of years he was working, uh, had different missions. He was working on the border of Italy. He was working on the border of Austria. And then eventually in uh, 1945, he made Aliyah himself to uh, Israel. He was on a boat too. And, um, and he had few, very few items that uh, that uh, remained from the family. But at one point, uh, there was uh, a fear that they will be discovered and he pretty much had to throw to the ocean everything that if someone will see that he has them, that they will understand that he is Jewish. He did manage to hide few pictures that uh, I actually have them with me today.
he was very, very independent. He lived in his own house. He cooked for himself. He cleaned for himself. He walked every day for an hour and was sharp-minded up to the last minute. But physically, when he turned 94 a little after, all of a sudden he got lymphoma. That really developed very, very quickly. One day I'm sitting in my house in Los Angeles and he's calling and he's telling me, I need you to come to Israel. It was around uh, December. And I told him I'm planning to come in June, in a few months. He said, no, 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 I need you to come as soon as possible. I'm not feeling well and uh, I don't know how long I still have to live. It's the first time I heard my father so weak the day after. I pretty much went on the plane. And since then I stayed with him for the last three and a half months until he passed away. Me and my dad went to the hospital um, in his last few weeks and we were taking turns um, watching over him. And I had one night where it was my shift and it was the first time that I felt like I could try and actually read the book. And so every night I would open the book and try and read it a little bit. And one night he woke up and he took the book. He wrote a dedication to me. And today that dedication is also tattooed on my arm. It's a dedication that he wrote to me. And it says a memory that will last until the end of generations. I had school to go back to. And I went to Saba and I said, Saba, I have to go back to school, but if you tell me to stay, I'll stay. And he looked at me and he said, go back to school. I'll see you in a few months. I'll still be here. I got on the plane and right when I landed, I got the call that he was in his last few hours. And I tried to turn around. I tried to catch a flight back, but I would have missed it. I would have missed the funeral. So I wasn't there in his very last minutes, but I was almost there. One day I just had a feeling in my gut that uh, something's not going to play out well and maybe I should go see him. So I called my mom and she said that uh, he's okay, um, everything's okay for now. We have a, there's a couple of weeks, if not a month, um, but don't, you don't need to come back from base now. As soon as uh, we finished speaking on the phone, I, uh, I immediately got on a bus. I get to his place at uh, almost like 11.30 p.m. and I'm on my, uh, my uniform. And I walk in the door and, and I see him and right away he just started glowing. He saluted me and he grabbed my hand. He squeezed it so tight and he tried maybe like three times to say something that was really important to him, but he couldn't say it because he was he was just so exhausted and he didn't have enough power. It was hard for me because I felt like that's what I went for, um, to be there for him in his last few moments. But the other part of me decided that it was actually better. I was there when he remembered me being there and I was there before he was bedridden. My last memories of him were still very strong. And that night he passed away at like maybe 3 a.m. And it was very emotional. The whole family was there and we were all there together. It was a very emotional time to see a person that you love so much um, take his last breath. The reason that we're doing this and what's most important is for his memory to live on, and for the Holocaust memory to live on, and for people to never get, forget what hate can do to people. I think it's important to remember, it doesn't matter who your, your, where your family comes from or what they've been through, just make sure to pass it on and to always be proud. And always be proud of who we are and what our ancestors went through. The Holocaust is the ultimate battle. And if they got through that, then we can get through anything.
COVID-19 has meant a number of different things for people all across the world. For some, it has simply meant change. For others, it has meant great loss. Across the world, countries are suffering with strains on the healthcare industry and the economy, as well as with great loss with massive death tolls. On a more personal scale, communities and individuals have lost their livelihoods and have lost loved ones. In a time of a global crisis, it can be more digestible and less painful to look at the crisis through numbers and statistics. However, focusing on how one community has been severely impacted offers insight into how the virus has touched the lives of all kinds of people. Buffalo, New York has been heavily impacted by COVID-19 on several different layers. The Erie County government and its partners are responsible for providing information, aid, and solace to the people of Erie County in this difficult time. The county is the, uh, is the, the, the government um, in, in this area, Erie County, that provides the services for individuals, uh, uh, whether they be the children, older adults, families, we create those linkages and provide those types of services. Uh, when we make changes or when we put policy together, we really have to think how it will impact um, communities that um, are disadvantaged. Though most people everywhere have felt the impacts of this pandemic, some people have felt it more than others. We are plagued by inequalities that only grow during a time like this. To combat this, large administrative actions must be taken. However, it's also important that smaller communities are taking steps to make changes themselves. Because Erie County government is the one that's interacting most immediately with the people of the county, it's important that the county government and its partners are thinking about how the virus is impacting groups who are already at a disadvantage. As we know at this time, domestic violence survivors are pretty isolated by their abusers, especially with the pandemic. Um, What we noticed in the first week was there was a decrease in hotline calls um, and then we slowly actually have seen um, in weeks following up that it's back to kind of normal in a higher amount than we've seen it as usual. We believe it was down um, the first week because there was so much going on. Schools were closing, parents were trying to figure out what was going on. Right now, um, advocates are just doing remote services and they're really only working with victims on the phone or via email. So the other thing with that is that safety planning looks a lot different now. So safety planning isn't really safety planning about necessarily leaving. It's almost like survival safety plans, making sure uh, the client knows her rights and accurate information about COVID. Because unfortunately, during this time, abusers have been giving false information to victims like Oh, you never can leave the house. You can't even go to grocery stores or close, not allowing them to watch TV, not allowing them to view the news. So a lot of people aren't really sure what the planning cannot do. Um, we also know that, um, and I think this is something that we've seen around the country, that communities of color have been impacted um, at disproportionate um, amounts. Um, just due to um, some of the underlying health conditions that are in the community. And that links it to um, a bunch of other things that have impacted the community as far as um, access to normal health care, access to fresh food and groceries, education, all those types of things um, bubble up during uh, this type of uh, Issue. Our next piece of this work really has to address the disparities for communities of color. I think we were we're at a pivotal point now because the this virus has very clearly highlighted the the fragility of communities of color. There's more African Americans who uh, are infected compared to the percentage of the population are actually dying from this. And that we have two communities, now one for two, two to one is one, and that's uh, pretty affluent for this area. But we think part of that is that that's where a lot of the healthcare nurses and doctors live and there are hospitals there. So that makes sense. But the other zip code that has been 
really impacted is 14215, which is actually one of the poorest communities in um, in Erie County. And the majority of, of that population are African Americans, and we're seeing um, some of the worst outcomes from the virus. County government is, is bureaucracy. Like, this was not designed to move quickly or nimbly or, re- or respond. Honestly, the how the systems are set up, I think they are reactive to what's happening, and then we're usually steps behind. This has, the, the virus has pushed our thinking in terms of we literally have to make some changes overnight. Um, once again, when we talk about the services that the county provides and, and coordinates, um, that role is even more important because of this this isolation that individuals have now experienced. And so um, not only the physical needs of individuals, um, the, the, the county helps to um, coordinate that effort, but also the mental health type needs. And so we have a Department of Mental Health that is um, reaching out to individuals but our parks department, right? So the governor um, said that parks are open because individuals need an opportunity to still get fresh air and walk as they social distance. Um, so we've seen an influx of people into the parks. So um, right now, it's the uh, beginning of April, um, we'd still expect this to be a little bit of a down and quiet season for us, getting ready for the summer. Um, and a weekday, like a Wednesday afternoon, right now, um, we'd see the volume that we would see on a Saturday afternoon in July. When they come to the parks, I think people kind of forget about what's going on and the parks are able to offer a safe place for people. Um, but at the same time, people still have to realize they have to maintain the social distancing that, uh, that elected officials are, are begging them to do. Um, so we're glad to be able to offer a place for people to do that and just hope for uh, people to stay safe while doing it. Uh, I think the role that the county government is playing is to first and foremost um, have the best interest of the public uh, make sure people are being safe and to be able to support them as much as they can. My name is uh, Pedro Molina. I am uh, a cartoonist and I am from Nicaragua. Did you come to Ithaca? Well, it's kind of a long story. I will try to make it short. I have been doing editorial cartooning for more than 20 years now. I started very young in Nicaragua. But what happened in April uh, 2018 is that there was a several protests in Nicaragua that took the streets. Uh, the protests began uh, because of a, a reform of the social security law in my country. But uh, the reason behind it, it, it was a lot of things that were, you know, uh, growing for many, many years until everything exploded, basically. I don't live in, in the capital of Nicaragua, in Managua. I live in Esteli, which is a, a city uh, up in the north of the country. So every time that there is something there to report, I will go to cover it myself, to send it to confidencial.com.net, which is the tell news website that publishes my, my work. So I went to cover the first protest. And, and uh, the, the protest, the people protesting were mostly students of college, university students. In that very first protest, we could see the violence of the government because at the end of that protest, there was a gunman from the government who went into the middle of the students and started shooting with a gun. We, as an independent media, we were covering 
all this situation and I was doing cartoons about that situation and trying to inform the world what's happening, what was happening in Nicaragua at the time. And the problem is that, of course, uh, let's go a little back and say that talking about media, that in Nicaragua the problem with media is that most of the most uh, important media outlets in Nicaragua are owned by the family in power. Daniel Ortega is the president of Nicaragua, Rosario Murillo. His wife is the vice president. And all of his kids, each one runs a different TV station. So what happened at that time is that uh, the government uh, started targeting not only people uh, in the streets, but also journalists. So very quickly, like one week later, the, the protest started, uh, a journalist was killed. He was doing a Facebook Live transmission from his city, Bluefields, which is in the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. And, and he was shot uh, to his head uh, by a sniper. So that gives you an idea of how dangerous it was for journalists at the time. And it is still that way in Nicaragua. It's disturbing in a lot of ways that now we see the leadership of the Sandinista movement, which is, at one point in time, a lot of us were very sympathetic to, and now we see them in power entrenched and you see a family dynasty developing around Daniel Ortega and a regime that has become very repressive and so using the the same kinds of violence against Nicaraguan citizens today that you know that we were fighting against 30 years ago but the, the political cards have flipped in a sense. We've associated Nicaragua with and, and the and, and Daniel Ortega with this sort of popular revolt against dictatorship that was kind of a, a happy story but that's a very old story. And, and in fact, things have really changed a lot. And now you, what you have is a brutal dictatorship and a highly corrupt and, and all that. So in December of that year, our newsroom, confidential.com.me, was taken over by the, the police of the dictatorship in the middle of the night. They got into our office and stole everything they could get their hands off, their hands off. They stole cameras, they stole computers, they stole paper, they stole whatever, microphones, whatever they could get their hands on. So in that situation, in December, I am, as a cartoonist, I am a member, a member of several international organizations. And I was sending reports every week from April to December about the situation in Nicaragua for journalists and in my case in particular as a cartoonist because I was, as I was getting death threats you know and stuff like that and they were uh, even starting to mention my own family so it was a very difficult situation so when when the police got in into our newsroom and then they took over the other TV station and shut it down I got a message from all these organizations telling me that it was uh, the time for me to leave. So we decided to leave in December. We leave the country in December 25, which is Christmas day. And we choose that day because uh, since it was a vacation day, it, uh, the surveillance in the airport and, and, and the borders were more, you know, so it was easier to get out. Two or three days before we were to leave, an email came in from Ithaca City of Asylum offering us the chance to come here, which is, of course, great. You know, we accepted immediately, immediately and decided to come over here. Yeah. Ithaca City of Asylum is part of a larger organization worldwide called the International Cities of Refuge Network, or ICORN. And ICORN receives petitions from writers and artists all around the world who are in trouble. Often they've been, those writers and artists have been referred to ICORN by somebody else. So in the case of Pedro, he's involved in international cartoonist groups and the cartoonist group said, uh, you're in trouble, 
you should, you know, he and he and his wife had decided that they they needed to leave, that their lives were in danger, and they contacted their people in the networks of, of, the, of cartoonists internationally, and the cartoonists said, well, there are these programs that bring people in, that invite artists and writers in. And so we heard from them, they said, hey, are you still looking for somebody? <laughs> because we had alerted them to the fact that, uh, that we were looking for someone to sponsor. The Honors Program at Ithaca College has had a relationship with Ithaca City of Asylum. The arrangement is one where, as International Visiting Scholar, he teaches for the college, he teaches for the Honors Program, and can also teach for other departments at the college, and he gives a number of visiting lectures or presentations around the community here in Ithaca, but also much more broadly. It was really exciting to think about the kinds of classes that he would be able to offer our students, it's about cartooning as social commentary, and classes about um, global issues from a journalistic and artistic perspective uh, we thought would be really exciting for our students. The class is about how to understand better what cartooning is and, and as, a, as a tool in the media box, you know, what can you do with it? The history of the editorial cartoon or the history of cartooning in general and how it has been used during whole history to denounce abuse of power, to fight for rights, you know, for the people and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, and it's it's been very interesting, very challenging because, you know, my English is not still the best, but uh, uh, we are getting there and I think we're, we're doing very good. You know, he's showing how you can use art and in this case, political cartoons as a, as a form of political struggle and as a way to you know, to challenge authoritarian regimes and to try to defend human rights and to defend democratic principles. And I think he does that very effectively with his work. It's a benefit for us to have people like him in the community, but it's such a loss for Nicaragua when somebody like Pedro has to leave. You know, when when the, when the people who are that gifted and that talented, I mean, they're the kind of people you, you want and you need to have in your country. And instead, when they have to flee and go elsewhere, to protect their own lives and to protect their families. It's a huge loss for Nicaragua. It was a, 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 a very difficult situation because of course you don't want to leave your country. You want to, you feel the need as a citizen, at least for myself is that way, as a citizen, but also as a professional, you know, to give something to the people in, in, in a situation like this. So I was doing my job and, and thinking about how to keep doing it. That was for me the main concern. Pedro is someone who is extremely hardworking and dedicated to his craft. Uh, he's also a real family man. He's like a complicated person in the way we all are. When Ithaca City of Asylum decided back in 2001 to come together, a group of writers, local writers, to offer welcome and community to persecuted writers around the world. It was to welcome a person into our community. And the first responsibility is to care for them because they've, they've been in trouble, they've been persecuted and they're at risk. But there's this tremendous benefit to the community, and that is that we have these amazing people <laughs> who come in and, and live among us and their kids go to school with our kids. I, I see that happening with Pedro and the Molina family. They're very much part of the community now. And it's not, not easy to join a new community in a new country with a new job and a new language that you ne never planned for. <laughs> it all happened at the last second. So they've come and they've really embraced this community. I know if I go into exile, some people may say, okay, he, he decided to take the easy way out. There is no easy way out. Exile is not an easy way out when you are forced to it. So, but I decided that if, if that was the best way for me to keep doing what I can do, what I can offer with my job, that then I, I, I had to do it. So that's what I did it. But it wasn't an easy, an easy decision to make. Yeah, because you leave your family behind, you leave everything you have, and then you go. I, I, I must stay. I mean, I, I am very lucky. I am very lucky, but because at least I have the support of this organization, these beautiful people that have helped me. 
to be uh, safe and, 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 most, and, and most important, helping me to keep doing my job, which is, like I was saying, my main concern. But there was a lot of journalists that were not that lucky. I think when you get to know somebody like, like, like Pedro, what it does is it helps to humanize the struggle. And you realize at the end of the day, leaving aside the politics, what matters are the people. You know, these are human beings. And, you know, Pedro is a gifted artist, the kind of, the kind of individual that every, every country needs. It, it, it enriches social and cultural and political life when you have people who can do, who have the kinds of skills that, that Pedro has. I am very proud to say that I, we haven't, I haven't missed a single day of work, even through all this situation, which I think is it's great. I have a very supporting family and they do understand how passionate I am about my work and how important it is in my life. But sometimes, you know, there is, there is this doubt. When uh, we were in Nicaragua and I was getting death threats all the time and everything, we decided, I got together with my, with my wife and we were talking and I told her, look, you know, because I am so into my work all the time that I may miss the red flags, you know, because I may, because of, of the kind of work I do, you kind of get used to get these people angry to you, you know, saying, uh, sending you hate messages and death threats and that kind of stuff. Uh, it hasn't been easy, and the situation, the weather, once again, is not the, you know, the most friendly weather over here. It's a big change, uh, but they have been very supportive, and they are safe, and I think we, we all value that as a family. So um, for my workout today, I had um, K-Mobility number two, which is pretty much just like a bunch of like dynamic work um, and strengthening work. And then just to add a little more stuff in. <laughs> the one thing that I always think about when it comes to track is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I remember in eighth grade when um, one of the teachers at the elementary school um, was handing out flyers. She's like, oh, like, come join track, da 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 Like, I used to run, I used to long jump, and I want to, like, coach people. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, I looked at the flyer and I was like, you know, my mom used to run before, so, like, I might as well give it a shot, too. All right, let's start from the beginning. I started track in eighth grade and I don't know that first year was like really weird because you know I like I had never ran track before that point so I don't really know what I was expecting um having tracks and stuff to go to like I wasn't really like I didn't have my hopes up because I didn't know what I was expecting if that makes sense because I'd never ran track before so I had no knowledge of like anything the elementary school that I went to, like, there was no track near us because there's not a lot of track in Chicago to begin with. Um, but there was no track near us. So we would practice in, um, hall, like, we would practice in the hallway or we would practice running stairs, like, up and down, like, around the school or, like, running on um, the first floor because the, I think the cafeteria, so, like, when they put the chairs and stuff up after school was over, then we would, like, have practice in there. Um, so I was just pretty used to, like, using whatever we had around us in order to, like, be a good athlete, I guess. My mom used to run track, I think, in high school and in college. Um, I didn't really know her that well 
Um, but I do know that she was like pretty fast and things like that. I never got to see her mom run. We met well after the fact. Um, we met well after the fact of her being an athlete. The day I got to see her mom run, unfortunately, is the day she died. Um, I'll never forget that. Uh, July 21st, 2001, it was about 6, 6.30, 6.30, and we were on a track at Suitland High School in uh, Suitland, Maryland. Um, but that's the only time I ever got to see her run, and unfortunately, she ran on into heaven. I just know like when I started running and when I started getting like good, my aunts and my uncles would always talk to me and they'd be like, yeah, you know, your mom used to run this fast or like hearing her name around and stuff like that. So I just be like, wow, like I just want to I want to be just like her. Like I want to be just as fast as her or if not better or whatever, anything like that. So, you know, I just feel like being able to run like I kind of get to have like a connection with her without like really knowing her, if that makes sense. And it's just, it's just something cool. Like she can look down at me and be like, yes, girl, you are continuing my legacy. And so yeah, it's just really nice to know that I'm good at something that she was good at. When it came to track, I was okay with it uh, at first until they had a track meet and I still have pictures of the, this track meet. Um, they had a track meet at the track where Caitlin runs now. They had a track meet at the very track. And Caitlin fell in the 200 on the curb coming around the corner. And I just went into a state of shock. And all I could see was her mother falling again. And um, at that point, I didn't want her to run anymore because, you know, the, the paranoia and the coincidence of her mom falling on a track and her, her falling, um, it really disturbed me. But what Caitlin told me next after I ran to her and told her, look, because it was raining, it was cold outside. Uh, Caitlin said, I said, Caitlin, you don't have to run no more. Uh, you don't ever have to run again or nothing. She said, no, daddy, I'm going to finish what I started. The one thing that I always think about when it comes to track is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's no way that um, I'd be able to do all of this um, without his help pretty much, um, which is why I stopped worrying about a whole bunch of stuff because at the end of the day, it's like God has a plan. So it's like, I'm convinced that the plan is gonna work out in my favor. So as long as I keep doing what I'm supposed to do, like no matter what happens, like at the end of the day, like I'm gonna end up being successful because of him. I don't really remember how I got in touch with Coach Potter, but whatever sparked that interaction, she just kept up with me. So yeah, like we just continued to have conversations. And then I remember my senior year after Outdoor City, because I definitely already committed to Ithaca by that point. Um, but what really, really made me happy was when I called her and told her that I had the first time I think like an hour after I ran like a 59 for the first time I called her and she sounded so happy I was like yay I was like this coach like really cares about me and like my development like she's happy for my success like I'm not even on her team yet and she was really invested um in the things that I was doing in order to better myself um in high school before I got to her team I think for Caitlin, it was, you know, as time went on, you saw the light bulbs go off with her. You saw her realize, like, wow, I, sh I was thinking this way, but I really shouldn't. I need to think this way, or I need to trust this, or I need to believe this, or I need to stop doing this. I think with Caitlin, when she went home last summer, she really, you know, maybe started to think about, hey, this is what I achieved, but if I wanted to achieve this, these are the adjustments I need to make. And she may have heard them from her teammates or her coaches, et cetera, but it was up to her to, like, make those changes. To the line, the winner is going to be wearing number five. That is Caitlin Hutchinson from Ithaca.
in the midst of the conversation of everyone, like, you're right, we're good, coach, we're ready. Um, coach Tyler points at me is like, points outside, like, meet me outside this hotel room. So I excuse myself, I walk outside, and Tyler shows me the announcement from the NCAA. And, of course, my heart, I think, dropped to my ankle. The first split second that I heard it, I wanted to laugh because it was like, ha, ah, that's that can't actually be happening. But after that, it was like, oh, wait, no, this is real. Like, I'm I'm not competing tomorrow. My Me and my teammates are not competing tomorrow. Coach won't be able to watch us and our families won't be able to be there. So it was really just crazy. Um, and you could see the hurt in her eyes, too, because I know that she was really excited have to walk back in and let them know that was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I really couldn't sugarcoat it. I just basically said, ladies, the NCAA has canceled the championship. The impact of the NCAA cancellation was definitely very disheartening and confusing. Um, and a lot of other emotions that I can't really explain because um, I guess I'm still trying to figure them out. But uh, when the championships were canceled, it just felt so weird and unreal almost. I was never one of the best athletes to ever come out of anywhere. Um, I was never the best at anything. So to finally make it to a national championship just meant a lot for me and then also to make it for an individual event that I was just getting good at um it just meant a whole lot to me because for me that was a symbol of hope that I knew that I was going to be great at this in the long run like there was nothing that happened in my past that negatively affected me in my past when it came to track that was ever going to stop me from continuing to work towards my goals I'm still trying to figure out why I love track so much. If anything, there's so many things to hate about it. I mean, it's extremely time consuming. Um, It hurts a lot. It can get very annoying, very frustrating um, quite often and quite quickly. But it's something about being able to go through all that and be rewarded with um, an amazing just like goal afterwards that you just feel so good about um and you just realize that everything that you've ever done to get to that point hasn't been for nothing honestly i'm trying to save up my money for paris 2024 <laughs> real real talk I'm, I'm serious about that I believe she can make it there. Um, Cause she, 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 Kaden is tuned in on that. People are, I mean, people are visibly angry and hurt about what happened. So we're going to go out there. We're going to do everything that we can. Like, you know, I'm saying this and I'm generalizing, but you know, I really can't speak for everybody else, but I can guarantee you about Ithaca's program that we're definitely going to go out there. We're going to get the title indoor and outdoor. And we're just going to have fun with it. Like, it's 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 gonna be an amazing time and I can't wait to see all the other records that are gonna be broken when we step back on the track again next fall. So you know, I'm not running out of time. I know that I'm gonna continue to have time to keep getting better and to keep building um on the things that I've been doing so far. I'm recording. We're live. Is Brian recording? <laughs> oh my gosh. Hi, what did we do? Perfect. Awesome. Oh, let's do it.
So I moved out to New York City three years ago to pursue modeling. And once I got picked up by an agency, I started working pretty much nine to five. I began my career over 10 years ago when I was a senior in high school. I have always wanted to be a model. Like when you're a little kid and they ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was like a model or an actress. That's it for me. And I grew up in a really small town in Colorado and would convince my mom to go drive me to these castings an hour and a half away. I started modeling um, kind of on a whim as a joke. I submitted my senior portraits. Um, a little lady you may know named Tyra Banks was having a teen plus size modeling competition. So if you were a teenager and you were above a size 12, you were eligible to enter. Uh, long story short, out of thousands of entries, I was placed in the top six and they flew my mom and I out to New York where I competed in kind of like a mini America's Next Top Model on her daytime TV show at the time, The Tyra Show. I was a runner up in the competition and at 17 years old, I thought, you know, since I didn't win, I lost and that was the end of the road for me, but little did I know, um, that was really only the beginning. So that was when I was 19 years old and was thrown into print modeling essentially and runway. So I did that a little bit in Arizona, a little bit in California, but wanted to finish college before I moved to be a full-time model. And during that time, I was approached by the state director for the USA organization. And she asked me if I wanted to compete for Miss Arizona USA. And I had no idea what goes into a pageant. All the preconceived notions, I had them all. And decided, hey, I have nothing to lose. And if anything, it'll give me more exposure for my modeling career that I'm trying to dive into. So I really stumbled into Miss Arizona and won on my first shot. And from there, it really my life changed forever. A lot of people think of modeling as just one type of thing. A lot of people associate modeling with like runway, or walking on a runway, um, or being in a magazine. So the majority of the modeling jobs that I did when I started was called e-com or e-commerce modeling, which is when brands would hire me to model clothes for their websites. For people that don't know much about fit modeling, it's the behind the scenes of fitting the actual garments before they ever get into the stores. So for example, if you were to go into Aerie and try on a 34D bra, that has been molded off of my body. Jordan does a lot of fit modeling. She uh, is basically hired to stay the same size in consistent measurements. And fit modeling is a very intimate process because a lot of the times you're, you're changing, you're in your bra and your underwear and you're being measured. That's like most people's worst nightmare. That was my worst nightmare before actually going into this. And so as I'm like in my little room and she's measuring me, she's shouting my measurements and there's a room with 30 people out on the other side of this wall all critiquing like oh her arm is a half an inch too big her waist is a half an inch too small her thigh is a quarter inch under picking me apart nobody at any time asked me what my name is like had conversation like it was just such a degrading experience for me. I started when I was 19 and it was right after I had just gone through this huge health transformation. I had um, some major health issues with my stomach all of a sudden. And I went through this about eight month process of trying to figure out how to heal my body. And in that process, I ended up losing over 50 pounds. So I was in a brand new body that I didn't even recognize. I went from a size eight to a size zero. So I started working a ton right off the bat. And when my body started kind of getting back to where it naturally wants to lie, between a four, six, all my clients dropped me. I would show up on set and they would tell me to go home. I've been told to lose weight. I've been told to gain weight. I've been told to cut my hair, grow my hair, get extensions, um, color my hair, you know, I've, oh, always been told something that something needs to change i need to tone this you know gain weight here but don't lose don't gain it there so uh, you know there's definitely in that way um as a model has definitely been challenging we need you to go eat two hamburgers and not work out at all which is something an agent told me i had to take photos of me eating a burger and send it to her i had to stop wa walking and take cabs around the city and as I'm doing that, I'm like, why, for what? So that I can gain it a few extra pounds and hope that one person will be accepting of me. You know, so I think that that's something that a lot of 
women in general struggle with. You know, you really have to be secure in your own skin to be in this industry and to not let this industry chew you up and spit you out. So I learned at a young age that when I am a model, I am not a person, I'm a product. And everyone is always going to have a different opinion on how they think I should look best. So I went out to LA uh, for a bunch of model castings, which is essentially like an interview for clients to see what I look like in person. And um, typically at a model casting, the client looks at you, they ask for your portfolio, they ask for your measurements, where you're from. But the first question this casting director asked me was, how many followers do you have on Instagram? And this was September of 2016. And I proudly stood up to him and I said, I had 10,000 followers. I was so proud of myself. And he looked at me, he laughed in my face and said, you better step it up, honey. And it was shocking to me the first time I ever experienced it. It was right when I got to New York. So this was three years ago, going into castings and you would have to write down, not your name, you'd write down your Instagram handle and the amount of followers you have underneath it. And that for me was kind of my aha moment of, oh my goodness, like what is social media? Why is it important? My name is Julian Green and I always knew that there is a direct correlation between having a really strong social media strategy and having a really strong influencer strategy because the only way that you grow is by having people talk about you on social media, right? And I met someone who now is a near and dear friend and um, she was kind of talking about the lack of, from the influencer side or just, you know, someone who wants to build their own established brand. Um, there was really no business and there was no one there supporting people uh, to kind of take their passion and their love for creating content and turning it into a business. I connected with Julian and she helped me figure out what I wanted to be online, who I wanted to be, what, what was Carolyn Moran, the brand online. The power of influencer marketing is when brands and influencers work together in repetitive ways. I originally started just by posting things that I genuinely loved and tagging the brands that I was already buying and loving and wearing. And suddenly these companies would be reaching out to me and be like, oh my gosh, we have to work with you. That's when I started realizing like, hmm, maybe there's something to this influencing world. But when I first started, I would send probably 25 to 50 messages a day, reaching out to brands, reaching out to people saying, I love this product, I love this brand, I would love to know if there's any way I could support you in the future. So with brands that that send me messages directly, usually they're, they're working on some sort of campaign. Then as a content creator, they'll send me what what goals they need to hit, and I will determine whether or not it fits for me and my audience. Usually most of my brand partners ask for an Instagram post, stories, and if they're doing a full round of social, they'll ask for a blog post as well as Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, et cetera, et cetera. My particular role is being proactive about getting people partnerships or understanding someone's strategy and then you know seeking out opportunities that align with their brand for carolyn it's really been you know all about um body positivity and um you know certain categories like um, intimates or things of that nature i think um we've really you know she has a lifestyle platform so there's um, more things that she is on brand for then she's not. The smart influencer marketers don't judge um, how much they pay an influencer based on their following. They'll judge them based on what their engagement is, what their conversion rate is like. And I've been surprised with how many brands do work with me. And I think that it's because I have a very high turnover. I have a high conversion rate because the people that are following me know me and they know that I'm only posting stuff that I either love and really believe in, or I'm doing it for a cause. I have a gluten allergy, so I'm always trying to find gluten-free snacks and stuff that just makes me feel good. Like it, there's, you will never just see me like post a photo with something and be like, happy Sunday. Like it's just not, that doesn't bring value. Um, so I think in that sense, I've been identified as a micro influencer. As a content creator, I found that the more vulnerable I became and the more of myself that I put out there, 
the better response I would get. If I'm putting something out there, it's because it came from my heart. It's because I'm proud of it. It's because I think it can help somebody else. And to know that that intention is not always received by people was really shocking to me. And it still is shocking to me. And going to the Wild West, there's like freedom of speech and anybody can say whatever they want to say. And you do have to have a thick skin. I had posted something within the last six months and I hashtagged in betweeny on a photo, which that is what I am in this industry. I'm an in-between sized model. And there's like a wild following that is very protective of this specific hashtag for some reason. And it went from people telling me that my tan was worse than Donald Trump to saying that they are gonna find me and kill me to saying that I was only posting this stuff because I was so hurt, I must have daddy issues, going after my family, my sisters getting DMs from these women. It's not my role to try and fix these internet trolls. And I didn't realize this dark side of the internet really existed until talking to some of my girlfriends and they're like, no, I, I get like, 50 DMs a day. I think we have two ends of the spectrum that our talent sits on is that like they will call out bullies and like put them on blast and be and and usually in those instances like other people that really rally around this influencer and follow them because they like them um will call that internet troll a troll. It was always very important for me to build a community and build a sense of community and for people to come to my page and feel welcome and feel uplifted and yes, it's important to talk about lipstick and hair products and how to dress to your size, but when you're able to connect and to relate to the person who's telling you about, about that stuff on a more personal level, that's when you start to build the trust in the relationship. There are so many preconceived notions that people get if you don't know me. Honestly, I, I really don't lead into conversations very often and tell people that I'm a model or that I was in the pageant world because I find that more often than not, it's a disservice to me. There's so much more to me, there's so much more to everybody than a handful of labels that can be used to summarize who you are. So it's, it's tough, especially with modeling too, is I get people just assume that I'm a dumb model all the time. I have to be honest, I really struggled with being okay with not taking a traditional nine to five job. I grew up with two parents that had very traditional jobs. They were both in education, but I knew that I didn't necessarily know what I was gonna do and, and following the unpe unbeaten path was really scary. I very much struggle with the term influencer because I think it has a lot of negative connotations. And I think through that, like kind of the, the jargon term influencer has then brought a lot of people in this industry who like, j I always say this, like just because you have an Instagram account doesn't mean you know how to use Instagram for a business. There's so many misconceptions about what the industry is like. And I think that everybody thinks that the industry is very glamorous which it is. There's so much beauty in the industry. And I honestly think that's why I'm still in it because there's days where I can be at a photo shoot and I'm working with an amazing team and then work on something together to create this beautiful image. But unfortunately that isn't the case very often. And like I mentioned before, like I think that people will look at these images and see these perfect women when in reality they've been altered so much to be that. Yeah, of course I like have hardships. Of course I have terrible days. Of course people say terrible things. Um, but at the end of the day, I just like, I feel so grateful to be in this job that although there are some really crappy things that come along with it, at the end of the day, I, I truly love what I do. So yes, I'm changing in my car and yes, I'm hustling. And yes, I've, you know, had canceled flights that I've had to rebook to get to the job and you've had to like hustle. But I feel like for anything that you love and you're passionate about, you make it work. The most successful ones sort of um, 
look inward and they define like, okay, this is what makes my point of view genuine. This is what I have to say. And they kind of, I, I feel like it's, um, there was this great Jimmy Iovine quote. He was like, you know, there's a reason that horses that race are wearing blinders. Like you can't look to the left and right of you constantly because you're, you're gonna take your eye off it. You're never gonna get to what's in front of you. And I think that's true, especially in this, you know, Instagram world is that you can't be looking at what everybody else is doing because you're just gonna end up kind of emulating them and you're not going to have anything new to share. My goal is to completely leave the modeling industry in the next five years. Um, I would like to have my business up and running. I want it, I envision it being this community filled with women all over the world that are sharing their unique experiences and perspectives. Five years to come, I don't necessarily know exactly what it's gonna look like, but I know that the influencing, the content creation industry will still be around. It's just going to take on different forms and potentially new mediums. And I think that's kind of an exciting challenge for me as a content creator to kind of keep that in my forefront of ways that I'm gonna to continue to evolve and grow along with the industry. I uh, work in the field of uh, paranormal. I'm not working. I'm a housewife. I'm a retired psychiatrist. I'm a senior journalism major. I work in a band. I work at a coffee shop. I'm currently unemployed <laughs> and proud. My girls and I, we have many things we enjoy doing together. We also have our own individual uh, pursuits. I started to take a, a, a period of time every day and enjoy something, something different. Like today, I had the opportunity to uh, look out at the ocean and it, it meant a lot to do that. On my free time, I like to paint, we play board games. And me and my sister do stuff outside a lot. It's not most different from other families. <laughs> An interesting thing about my family is that we're already kind of physically, socially, whatever you want to call it, distant. Me and my dad and my younger sister live here in Massachusetts. Then my mom, my stepdad, and my older sister live in Florida and a majority of my family lives in the Philippines. Yeah. 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 We're very, we very close and fun, fun family. <laughs> because of the size of the family, so basically mommy and daddy has 13 children. So each month, plus the grandchildren, they will have there will be birthdays so we will be gathering around a lot like so the family yeah, bond family. is really strong we're very close like that so and, and i think it is because also how we were raised up, raised by our parents yeah even if we live in different cities or even some even some are abroad or not in cebu in manila we still reach out to each other and catch up don't see each other that often. Um, we FaceTime and text a lot. <laughs> um, oh my God, so many questions, Nicole. <laughs> it only totally looks like that. <laughs> what? When we do get together, it's a lot of fun. We live in different parts of the world with different last names, but we are all part of this one big, close, but distant family.
I'm married, busy. Um, I have three beautiful daughters. My two daughters, they always come here in their summer vacation. I was divorced and got remarried. I found myself in a position where I had a new family. I had three stepdaughters who uh, liked to come and visit. They liked to bring their friends. And sometimes they like to come all at the same time. So we looked for a bigger house. And then uh, after five years in the smaller house, we moved here. I was supposed to graduate in May and then take the summer off just to, you know, do a part-time job, maybe a waitress or do something just so I could enjoy my summer. And then I was going to relocate to Florida where my mother lives. I left school thinking we were going to, you know, come back from spring break, power through those last six weeks or so, and then graduate. Um, you know, end the chapter the way that you're supposed to end this chapter in your life. And then COVID-19 happened. One could say, you know, the lockdown is, is, is really like a mini prison sentence because we got a virus going around. Fortunately, myself, fairly large. We've got an empty room uh, that's totally isolated with a shower. Now, that can be sealed off only, uh, you know, except for um, sending meals in there, and that can be done by somebody with a mask, <laughs> maintaining quite a bit of distance. I think it's a lot harder for my family in the Philippines because they live in an urban, crowded city. Their houses are kind of small. If someone in my house were to get sick, I don't know how well we would be able to isolate and care for them. It's a three-bedroom apartment. Uh, the bathroom is down near the, the two um, the girls' rooms. Um, mine is on the opposite end of the apartment. And we got a kitchen and living room open plan type of thing and dining area. And that pretty much uh, opens the whole house up to Whatever floats in here is going to float out that way eventually, too. My daughter, Nicole, uh, gave me the news, and initially there was shock. Right from the beginning, we clicked. His personality was always Bubbly, although he, he made it a point to express road rage on a regular, on a regular basis. So, it was like a brother, and definitely like an uncle to us, my children. We recently lost my uncle to COVID, and that really shook my family. His children were very, very fortunate to have him for a dad. They'll so have a memorial and somewhere when the, in the future when it becomes a little safer to have uh, somewhat larger groups together. Everything changed so quickly. My sister and I were even more worried now to bring the virus into our house because my dad is at such high risk. I'm not gonna walk in fear of this disease or any other. I go by my place of worship and I still skip some time there. You know, if God calls me up, you know, today, then I'm going to be going. This virus has really revealed some of the socioeconomic differences between my friends, my classmates, my coworkers. But I think it's even shown some of the differences that are just within my family. Dad's retired and my sister's unemployed. So my check's the only consistent one coming into the house right now. So she's going to stop working, and once that happens, there will be no one in my house to bring in any income. 
Well, certainly I've seen a loss in the stock market, uh, which has been significant. Uh, my immediate financial situation is still stable. A family member's been uh, essentially laid off of work now for, I guess it's going on the third week, ever since we had more of a shutdown uh, order in Florida. Now they're not working. Because of the COVID-19, they stay home. And we support them. So I work from home, so I get the same pay. So I still get paid. And my mama, she still gets her remittances from my brothers. I think we are blessed because my because my dad is the one who's uh, supporting us right now. And he's currently ab uh, abroad. He's a seaman. That's why... Still monthly, we still um, receive his his money. Remittances, yeah. Oh, the food we have plenty of. We got a freezer full, and for the most part, we've been eating out of that right now. Well, we're all set. We're good for at least a couple weeks if they, we have to be. Uh, what's most is we eat more unhealthy food like canned goods, noodles noodles because we barely go out to buy and make real food. I had to buy these, the six pack of these like flushable wipes. I could not find any toilet paper. For the toilet paper, I think we have a decent supply. Actually, we don't have prob problem in our um, comfort room. There's no <laughs> toilet paper. To Water. Water. That's all. Because we never know when will this lockdown end, so we really need to like save our money also and not spend everything. So no more wants, only needs. <laughs> I, was yelling at the cats. I know we don't have much, but we got a lot more than other people might have. So I'm definitely Thank thankful you. for my friends and my family right. and that we're all safe yeah. and we're doing good for the most part. Yeah. I hope when we come out of this, that we can learn to appreciate what we do have and to make the most of our time. To appreciate luxuries like toilet paper or looking at the ocean. Or being able to hug our loved ones while we still can. Everything can change in the moment. Don't waste it.